we're all influenced by the education that we were exposed to. Let's talk about some of the influential theories that Darwin learned when he was in school that impacted his theory of evolution by natural selection. Many people influenced Darwin. He grew up in the 1800s and already a lot of research had been done. Let's remind ourselves of some of the key observations that we already knew about and, you know, were pretty widely recognized at this point in time. First, species are well suited to their environments. There's deep similarities between species, whether especially when you're looking at the anatomy of animals. There's the enormous diversity of living things, and there's also fossils, which throw a lot of wrenches in the plan of essentialism. Let's look at some of the more specific discoveries and the people who influenced them. So in 17, six, seven, 1676, two centuries before Darwin, there was a large femur discovered in a rock quarry at Cornwall. Um, this was given to Robert Platt. He was a professor of chemistry at Oxford. You know, at this point, they didn't know what fossils were. So they were just like, okay, you're a scientist. You can look at it, right? Um, and of course, at the time, they're like, okay, obviously this belongs to a giant because they didn't have any context. Do you know what it is? If you guess dinosaurs, you would be correct. And in the 1800s, they just keep on discovering more and more of these large lizards in the British Isles. Here are a few examples of the dinosaurs that they were finding at this point, period in time. Dinosauria was officially named in 1842 by Sir Richard Owens. This name means terrible lizards. I love looking at the etymology of scientific names because you get some pretty good ones. Um, so here we're getting more and more evidence that there were different periods of life on Earth with forms that were vastly different today and are not found right now. Um, and it took them a while to figure out that birds are the modern descendants of dinosaurs. Next up is Georges-Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon. He lived in the 1700s, um, and he explicitly linked environment to variation. So people had already recognized that species are well suited to their environment, but he is like, we, there's an explicit link between the variation we see and the environment with which species live in. Um, unfortunately, he didn't really have a mechanism to describe why this occurred. He also had the theory of American degeneracy. He had this theory that um, all of the animals and life in the Americas were degenerate and just not as good as European. And this was also part of the uh, part of a theory to <laughs> try and continue to subjugate the American colonists. Um, this was actually disproven by Thomas Jefferson. Um, but again, um, for all of his theories and recognizing that the variation we see in living organisms is related to the environment which they live in, he didn't have a reason to explain why that happened. Here we have a great quote from Darwin in the late 1700s. The strongest and most active animal should propagate the species, which should thence become improved. So we have a little bit of proto-evolutionary fitness here, but we're actually still talking about Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather. Next, let's talk about geology, because even though this isn't about biology, this has some really interesting insights. Um, uniformitarianism is an idea that was um, put together by Charles Lyell and J James Hutton. They wrote these um, two influential books, Principles of Geology and Theory of the Earth. Uniformitarianism is the idea that if you go out into the world, you can observe geological change. Um, they looked at street beds, and if you watch really carefully, you'll notice in certain parts sediment is taken away, but in other parts it's gradually deposited, but it is very, very slow. So their theory of human or uniformitarianism is that geological processes are uniform over time. And if the ones that we can observe are incredibly slow, well, that's how all geological processes are. And if we have really deep caverns, super tall mountains, and geological processes are slow, then the earth must be very old to account for all of the geological formations of the time. This was a really shook up the world of geology because the uh, predominant opinion at the time was the earth was very young um, because people were using the Bible as a guide and counting backward to calculate the age of the earth. 
The next important figure is Georges Cuvier. He was a French anatomist who lived in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Um, he noticed that fossils existed and he's like, okay, so obviously there are different um, types of life on earth at different periods of time. Um, so obviously big catastrophes happened to wipe out one period of life and then create it anew. So he allowed for extinction to happen, but he thought that there were distinct periods of um, different processes happening because, due to a creator. So he still thought that the earth was um, rather young caught and all, the, all of these catastrophic disasters were causing this extinction and replacing everything with new species. Uh, he was also the person who separated Asian and African elephants into different species, but strangely, he thought these types were completely unrelated. So you can see he is still adhering to the essentialist paradigm here. Um, he also thought that the environment molds the animal, but he only would accept that any similarities we saw were due to shared functions. So he would simply have types of organisms. Um, today, we might call this homoplasy. Um, and he also accepted that organisms were made of integrated parts, but not that they could change over time. Um, in contrast, Geoffrey saint liked to debate Cuvier all the time. Um, and he also lived in the late 1700s and um, early 1800s. Instead, Geoffrey saint saw a unity of composition. So he was noticing that there's broad similarities between different species explicitly linking them together. He also came up with the term evolutionary accidents. Um, both of these terms are similar to words we use today. Um, homology is this unity of composition and evolutionary accidents are of course mutations. The next important figure is Jean-Baptiste Lamarck around the same period of time of the late 1700s and early 1800s. He came up with the theory of inheritance by acquired characteristics. So he is actually the first person to come up with a mechanism of change to explain why variation is linked to environmental differences. He thought that change happened within a single in within a single individual. So depending on what you used in your body, um, the use or disuse of traits would actually cause your body to change based on the environmental need. His classic example of inheritance by acquired characteristics was talking about the giraffe and how it elongated its neck. So there would be an original ancestor with a short neck, but it gradually stretched its neck because it needed to reach leaves higher on the tree. So driven by this inner need, there, each generation would have a slightly longer neck. Of course, we know this doesn't happen because when someone loses a limb, their babies are still born with all four limbs. So there isn't really many examples where this change during your lifetime will cause that in, to happen in your offspring. Though it does give us some pretty fun examples to make fun of in our comics. In this example here, we have a really buff baby in the caption. All I can say is my work, wife worked out every day when she was pregnant. So even though that Lamarck's theory wasn't correct, it was very influential because it was the first mechanism to describe how we could get all of this change. Important thing was people were noticing population growth. Um, and the person who most famously, famously noticed it was Thomas Robert Malthus. He wrote an essay on the principle of population, and he's the person who coined the term struggle for existence. So Malthus noticed that there was a different relationship with how our increase in food production was increasing and how our population was growing. He noticed that there was exponential population growth, but we were only increasing the amount of food we were producing linearly. And this would eventually cause a crisis to happen when we have so many more people than we have the ability to feed. So when these lines overlap, that is our Malthusian trap or our Malthusian crisis. So he was very worried about population growth and outstripping the amount of resources that we have. If this reminds you of an example of popular media within the past couple of years, you'd be right. One of my favorite things was seeing some of the memes pop up about Thanos after Infinity War. Um, 
And people were like, well, why can't he just use the gauntlet to create more resources? The problem here is if resources are only increasing linearly, but we have exponential population growth, we're just going to, we're just delaying the onset of that Malthusian trap. So not condoning, you know, genocide by randomly killing half the population, but there is a genuine concern for what overpopulation, especially with exponential growth, does to the environment. Um, lastly, Adam Smith was another influential character. He was a little bit before some of these people. He lived in the early 1700s. Um, he is the one who came up with the term, the invisible hand of the market. So he was an economist and he really loved capitalism. Capitalism has its faults. Um, but he is the person who came up with the idea that there's nothing actively controlling capitalist markets. And this was a big deal at the time because people assumed that there had to be a divine creator or someone controlling everything to make complex processes work. And this was the first idea where someone was saying that its individual actions can still create a complex system. If, you care, if you're interested in learning more about what the invisible hand of the market is, um, there's many different needs happening. So people are seeking profit, uh, but we also have needs of the society. And we have this competition and self-interest between these different parties that act as that re regulating force or that invisible hand. Um, if you're interested in how this influenced Darwin, I highly recommend you read this article written by Matt Ridley. Um, he's a major evolutionary biologist, uh, came up with the Red Queen hypothesis. The end of his article goes to defend capitalism and how that's good, and that is definitely taking it too far. But the beginning of this article does a really nice job of describing how the theories of the invisible hand of the market um, led Darwin to realize that there doesn't have to be a guiding force to create complex things. So let's review all of these biological insights. We know that species are well suited to their environments and that there's deep similarity among cell life, especially when you look at the anatomy of animals. There's just a lot of living things in the world. And different animals are alive at different times at different places. The earth is very old, which gives a long time for evolution to happen. There's competition for limited resources and individual actions can create complexity. There doesn't necessarily have to be a creator guiding everything. So can you explain who influenced Darwin?